Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And today we're going to discuss a special program that is that Wheaton College has undertaken, uh, the um, Humanitarian Disaster Institute. And our guest is Jamie Ayton, who's founder and executive director of that institute. So welcome, Jamie. We're glad you could be with us today. Well, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. So the first question we always ask when we when we do one of these, and our, our topic is how the church can come alongside people and minister to them in the midst of what oftentimes are very challenging circumstances and situations, uh, what uh, sometimes insurance companies uh, call acts of God, and uh, um, and uh, and Jamie's. Uh, School, Wheaton College, has just launched a program that is designed to train people in this area. So how did you get into this gig, Jamie? Where did, where did, where did you start, and how did you end up in the slot that you're in? Well, you know, by, by training, I'm actually a psychologist, and this was nothing that I set out to do. That uh, The way that I got involved in this work was that my family and I, right out of grad school, moved to South Mississippi for my very first teaching job. And then six days later, Hurricane Katrina struck our community. Mm. And uh, where did you go to grad school, by the way? I, I went to uh, Indiana State University. Okay, so you're so you're Midwest educated, huh? I'm, I'm Midwest through and through. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, and so you came to the South and experienced that great, wonderful. Um, event that we know uh, from the Gulf Coast in Houston, uh, as we know as a hurricane, which is a frighteningly powerful event that is an extreme disruptor of communities when the when the hurricane is powerful enough. And Katrina certainly probably was the hurricane of the last decade, just as Harvey could probably qual- qualify as the hurricane of the decade so far in this, in this decade. So, um, so what was that like? You know, we, we found that we were totally unprepared, and in fact, we, we didn't even realize Katrina was headed our direction until church that Sunday morning, mm-hmm. right before the storm hit, which came on Monday, that uh, since we had just moved from the Chicago area, our cell phones didn't get a signal there. Uh, we lived out in the country, so we had no cable or TV signal yet. Cable person supposed to come on Monday. And so we were really kind of disconnected. You know, the last I knew at work on Friday was the storm was supposed to hit somewhere on the other side of Louisiana. And then that Sunday morning, the pastor gets up to the church that we were visiting at and comes up and leans against the podium and a slow southern draw says, if you remember Camille, you know what I'm about ready to talk about. Hmm. So, you know, he then goes on to talk about this hurricane and my wife and I are looking at each other about what do we do for a hurricane? You know, we're from the Midwest that if it was a, a tornado, we go to the basement, but there's no basements here. Correct. What do we do? Yeah. So that was my my introduction to Katrina and into the disaster world. And 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 what uh, what kind of situation did you find yourself in after the hurricane? Well, we ended up being quite fortunate. We had roof damage and damage outdoors and, and lost a few things, but uh, by, and, by and large, very, very fortunate. You know, we had neighbors that lost everything through that disaster. Uh, and I remember still driving into our community after the storm, and it, it just looked like the uh, pine trees had been torpedoes just going right through people's homes and roofs just gone. And in some places, it looked like a bomb had gone off where, you know, so it was a very different scene in Mississippi versus New Orleans, where New Orleans was much more the flooding. Whereas in Mississippi, you saw much more of the the wind damage there. Inter- interesting. My son was in law school during the time of of uh, Katrina and uh, went down to give um, legal advice with some of the relief agencies down there for a time. I was down there for a few months, um, mostly in the New Orleans area, in the poor areas of New Orleans, and and was very involved and in, and got to see firsthand what what hurricanes can do, which is actually pretty pretty frightening stuff. I mean, anyone who's kept up with what's going on with Harvey and particularly what's going on in Puerto Rico, you know, knows that the effects are lingering. 
Yeah, and, and they're going to continue to linger for quite some time, likely. Yeah, and that's that's one of the challenges, isn't it, of, of giving humanitarian disaster relief is there's a spotlight on a disaster that comes, and everyone's aware of it, and then, you know, life moves on for most people, but the situation that people find themselves in after a disaster in the area itself, um, that still lingers and hangs on. Oh, most, most definitely. You know, one of the things that – uh, right after Katrina, I, after, as I was doing the work there and started to do research and working with churches and other uh, relief organizations, started getting asked to speak and share about what was happening um, in the area and how things were going with, re- with recovery. And whenever I could, I'd always try to fly out of Biloxi, out of the airport there. And right as we would take off, I'd try to take a quick snapshot of a picture of the houses down below and, and would get, try to get a picture of the, the blue roofs. You know, so those were the houses where people were putting tarps over to try to fix the roofs. And anytime I would go to speak, I would ask people about how do you think the recovery is going to go? And what I noticed is within about six months, most people, if they weren't from that area or didn't have connections, they assumed life would go back to normal. And then I would pull up on the screen behind me a picture of all these blue roofs to kind of highlight the damage. And, you know, I continued to do that for years, actually, Mm -hmm. and could still get images of blue roofs taking off from that airport that for many people it can take years if in some cases the psychological and even spiritual impact may last a lifetime yeah in fact um you know i'm from i am from houston and uh houston and dallas both absorbed a ton of people particularly from the new orleans area after that hurricane had to take care of them for a very long time and in fact some people never went back um, so, I mean, it, so it can be a dislocating event for a lot of people, and they actually have to start from scratch with their lives all over again. Yeah, you know, in fact, we actually were down in uh, Houston after Harvey within just a few weeks doing research and training there, and we saw something similar when we went down to the Baton Rouge area after the flooding back in 2016, where you had a lot of people that were displaced from Katrina that had moved to these two different geographic locations, which were heavily populated by Katrina evacuees that stayed and who were hit again. And what we found in our research was those that, and you know, this is pretty obvious, but those that went through Katrina and then were affected again tended to struggle even more. Yeah, sure. I mean, the 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 impact of of losing everything that you're used to having around you is pretty uh, devastating psychologically. What am I telling you? You're a psychologist, but still. Um, uh, Most people, like I say, most people think, oh, you just turn the page. But this page Mm -hmm. doesn't turn quite so easily. Oh, you know, one of the things that has always uh, kind of stood out to me in my memory since Katrina was there was a uh, cartoonist, actually, up in Jackson after the storm that had made a real simple cartoon for the a uh, paper out of there, and it was simply a timeline is all it was, just a simple timeline, and it had a BK and AK, you know, before Katrina and after Katrina. And one of the things that I've seen from studying disasters these last 12 years and across the globe has been no matter where we've gone or what the disaster has been, oftentimes that disaster splits people's experience into that this was life before and now this is life afterwards, that it really does make a lasting impact on many people. Interesting. Well, let's 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 talk a little bit about the Institute itself and what led to its formation and and what it seeks to take a look at and how it operates. Um, uh, you, you said you were the founder as well as the executive director, so um, so I, I can't think of asking anyone more qualified to talk about its roots and origins. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the Institute, and then we'll turn our attention to the program that comes out of it. Great. Well, our institute, uh, the Humanitarian Disaster Institute, is the country's very first Christian and faith-based academic disaster research center. Mm -hmm. So there's a few other disaster research centers out there, but we're the first ones to really focus in on faith-based issues. And our main mission is to equip local churches to better prepare and care in a disaster-filled world. Mm -hmm. And we do that through training and through research, consultation, and through resource development. And we initially got our start, you know, like I shared, it kind of does trace back to Katrina, that I I remember on the ground seeing so many churches do great work and Christian relief organizations doing great work. But I also saw many people that sometimes caused harm unintentionally, Hmm. or that they were often replicating the wheel. Like I remember there was a 
a, a church group in Biloxi and another one over in Gulfport who'd spent about six months and a lot of money and a lot of resources developing a manual on how to respond. And then both of them were very disappointed when I was asked to come in and consult to share with them that there were already five of those manuals already free online. Hmm. And so just kind of realized there wasn't really a hub where people could go for trusted information to figure out how to respond. And so that's what eventually led and gave birth to the Institute here at Wheaton once I got here. And so before it became a formal program, what did that involve? So I was very fortunate that that was actually part of the negotiations with me coming to Wheaton College was Mm. making it very clearly known that I had really hoped to start an institute because one of the things that I had seen when I was working when the disaster was in my own backyard were individuals or groups that would just come in, parachute in, and take from the community and leave. So so granted, there, there is a need for groups to come in and provide relief. But I also saw that, especially researchers, if you don't have an infrastructure, then you're never really giving back to those that are providing the, the data and um, the experience that you're learning from. And so really saw some groups like the RAND Corporation and uh, a major research center out of UCLA and Tulane that I also had a chance to collaborate with and saw how having that infrastructure allowed them to walk alongside communities for the long term and also not just work in one disaster zone, but you could actually be working in multiple places if you had the right uh, right infrastructure. So you said you're the first um, such organization that's that's Christian, at least is allocated at a Christian institution. You said there are other such organizations. Uh, what are what are some of those? Well, there's others that are doing just really great work that have been around a lot longer. One of the very first ones was a, a disaster research center out of University of Delaware, hmm. and most of its emphasis is on engineering and infrastructure rebuilding uh, those types of. Um, uh, issues. And then there's also groups out there, like in uh, New York, out of a, one of the universities that focuses specifically on disaster mental health, another one that does disaster mental health out of uh, North Dakota University there, the Disaster Mental Health Institute. But where we've really tried to find our space is to come in and walk alongside the faith communities. Hmm. And is that uh, faith communities is that only churches, or is that nonprofits in the area and that kind of thing? Both. So the way that we go about approaching our work is that we don't go anywhere without an invitation. Hmm. That we want to make sure that we don't come in and accidentally help, you know, add to that overload of the local capacity. Uh, you know, I, I saw examples in different disasters where people coming in who weren't necessarily invited or weren't part of a formalized response would come in and then suddenly they were stranded. They didn't have a place to stay. They didn't have food or resources. So then the people that were hit the hardest now are taking care of the volunteers. Hmm. So we we try to avoid that by always making sure that we've been invited by the local community uh, when we go and respond. So um, this gets into an area I did want to talk about, which is things that people do that actually don't contribute or help the situation but actually harm it. And I take it that's one of them, that you just – a group comes in, uninvited, no one knows they're coming, and all of a sudden here's another group of people that have to be taken care of and attention is, becomes divided. Exactly. And, you know, so one of the things, that one of the mantras that we often share with groups that we work with is to tell them not to be an SUV, mm-hmm. a spontaneous, unaffiliated volunteer. <laughs> so now, now at the same time, to put that in context, we're, we're not saying don't reach out and help your neighbor in the event of a disaster. Quite the opposite. That, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples of all time was in Louisiana in 2016, where maybe you've heard of the, the Cajun Navy, mm-hmm. that, you know, you had a group of, of folks that, you know, had a skill. They, you know, they were um, fishermen and, and worked in, in the boating industry and really came to the relief of those in need. And had it not been for them, many more people would have likely died from that flood. Are you talking and about now, in Baton Rouge? Yeah, in Baton Rouge, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that's an example where it happened in your community and you have a skill and you're helping your neighbor. Mm-hmm. But, but that's very different than, for instance, someone who, let's say, is living in um, Indiana sees that there's the flood and decides, you know what, I'm just going to hop a plane and fly in or just drive down tonight on my own to help. You know, that that's the one that we kind of want to curb and say, okay, wait a minute, back up. And is there an organization that's already doing work that you can plug into? Or do you have local ties 
where you can actually go down and, and help a neighbor, somebody that you're going to be able to go down there and know that there's need. So it, it becomes more hectic when we just jump in the vehicle and take off to help without being connected in some way prior. Yeah, the Cajun Navy was very important to Houston as well. Uh, they, there was a lot of reporting on on the role that they had. Of course, you know, that Houston hurricane was much more about uh, water than it was wind. And, oh, yeah. uh, um, and so... Uh, a, a navy was necessary because the city had become uh, not just a port stop, but it had become you know an ocean itself. So it was it was pretty messy. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And you know, wh- one of the other things that I would really encourage groups who are or individuals even that want to help is to make sure that we're helping with humility. Mm-hmm. That sometimes when a disaster hits, we think we know what that community needs. And more often than not, we're, we're wrong, mm-hmm. you know, and one of the best ways we can help, you know, obviously is through prayer. But um, in terms of another way that we can help is giving to organizations or volunteering through organizations. And we want to make sure that we don't do the sort of thing where we just start sending goods without hearing from that local community or trusted organizations that goods are actually needed. Okay. Because, again, there's a whole logistics level. Lo- the logistics are, are strained in an area when, when a disaster comes. And when you add to the logistical load without it feeding into an established – some kind of established pipeline, you're actually getting in the way, aren't you? Oh, indeed. That's totally the case. You know, and the other thing is sometimes even our good intentions, though, can cause more harm or just become wasteful. You know, one of the examples that often comes to mind for me after Katrina was there was a a church that actually raised sixty thousand dollars and they rented a semi truck and hired a driver and filled that entire back end of that truck with um, frozen microwavable meals and they sent them down to the coast but there, there, there were two big problems. There, you know, there was no electricity, so there was no way to keep the food cold. And even if you had a way of cooking it, you know, it, it was going to go bad because you, you didn't have electricity. Uh-huh. So they ended up having sixty thousand dollars worth of food just rot along the side of the road. Oh wow! So we we want to make sure that we're helping. Hmm. So um, so the I I take it the institute helps people get prepared, and then and then helps with structuring how you do relief. What else does the Institute do? Yeah, so one of the things that we always try to start with is is research, that we want to make sure that the guidance and recommendations that we provide are, are based on our faith and our science. That, again, that we can make these recommendations and have a strong sense of confidence that what we're recommending really is going to provide aid to those who have been impacted. And so we do a lot of research, um, you know, just thinking about this past fall, we were studying all the major hurricanes that hit. We were, you know, doing research over in Mexico. We've been doing research in Botswana. So we've got projects going on right now in eight different countries. Hmm. And that research involves... um uh, what's effective, the psychological impact on people, or all those things? What does is, what is the research involve? Yeah, it's really all the above. But w- one of the main drivers is we're trying to understand how does going through a disaster impact people's faith, and how does our faith help us uh, live more resilient in times of disaster? Mm-hmm. And then how is it connected to our emotional well-being as well? Mm-hmm. And then from that, we use that knowledge to then develop interventions and resources that we then train others in how to use. Uh, okay, so um, I, I'm, I'm probably going to come back to this on the other side of the break. We, we've got a little bit of time before then. So uh, one of the questions I will be asking is, so I'm a local church, you know, kind of what can I do? Uh, but I, I'm going to save that. I'm just signaling to you that we're going to discuss it. What, what else does the Institute do? Or at least what is the – let me ask it this way. The master's program that you've developed, what is, what is involved in that? Oh, we're, we're very excited about the master's program. That For us, it's really taking that mission statement of equipping the church to better prepare and care to that next level. That what we're getting ready to do now is to help uh, train the next generation of professional Christian relief and development workers. That these are folks that will be equipped to go out and work in uh, Christian relief agencies. Maybe they might work with emergency management groups, or they might be working in nonprofits and tackling issues related to disasters like the refugee crisis or um, um, trying to stop traf- human trafficking, for example. Hmm. So, um, so you're really talking about a full range of experiences that aren't just you know the 
the um, weather events and that kind of thing that, that suddenly plunge someone into a situation. You're talking about longer-term kinds of situations that involve um, the, the diaspora movement that's going on in the world right now, et cetera, because of political situations, et cetera. Exactly. That for us, we really see disasters as a biblical justice issue, and that as Christians and as part of the church, that we have a moral obligation to respond. That when these events strike, you know, you, you may have heard it said before that disasters don't discriminate, which to a point that's true, mm -hmm. that any of us can be affected. Yet when we take a closer look, we see that it's typically the poor and the marginalized and those with the fewer resources that tend to be impacted the most by a disaster. Mm -hmm. And so that involves things like poverty um, that may make some of these disasters even more difficult for people. So you can't just respond just to the event. We have to also think larger about what are some of the unnatural disasters that may be making it worse for people, and how can we as Christians intervene? And of course, when you're talking about uh, concerns for for justice and that kind of thing, you're also talking about compassion and love for your neighbor and those kinds of values as well, which are certainly central Christian values. Yeah, and, and as an institute and at the heart of our master's program really lies the verse of Micah 6, 8, mm -hmm. that we really want to equip our students to go forward and to to do so with humility and to promote mercy and justice. Interesting. Um, so what does that program look like? I mean, just in terms of its uh, – uh, let's, let's assume for the sake of this discussion, I'm younger than I am, and, and thinking about coming to Wheaton and the issue of doing Christian disaster relief uh, is attractive. Uh, what am I walking into? What, what kind of a program is involved? What would, what would I be uh, – what, what would the structure of the program look like? We, we actually have uh, two main tracks for our master's program. The first one is a one-year on-campus traditional residency track. Um, so what we're finding that most of the students that are applying to that one tend to be uh, maybe straight out of undergrad studies, or maybe they've been working for a few years and realizing, I'm just really having this sense of calling to help in this way, but really don't know where to start. I, I didn't go to school for that. So that tends to be who we're largely attracting for the on-campus one-year program. But then we also have a two-year part-time hybrid program. So even you could actually come join us if you wanted. Um, so no matter really what stage of life a person is in, and that one, what we're noticing tends to be people that have already maybe been working out in the field for some time already, and they're wanting to kind of come back and get some new skills, or they're looking to advance in their career. Maybe they've been out 8 to 15 years. Um, but we're also finding a lot of people who have worked and been quite successful in a different sector, so maybe like medicine, for example, even. Um, and now after eight or ten years of practicing medicine, realizing I'm really feeling this strong call that I want to go and work in an international setting and, and do humanitarian medicine, for example. And so are looking to combine the skill or expertise they've already got and now use it in a new way. Now, uh, do you have any partnerships with um – with uh, nonprofits that work in this area, and are, are, are you? I take it you're set up to help them train some of their people for the kinds of work, kind of work they will be doing. Exactly, and you know that that's taken on a lot of different forms. And and one way that we're doing that is that we have a number of partnership agreements with different organizations that our students will go out and do field work with, and do internships and volunteer through. Uh, to gain more on-the-ground experience, but at the same time, also inviting those partner organizations to send their staff to us as well for additional training. So one example of that would be that right now we're partnering with the Accord Network, which is a, a large association of around 100 different Christian uh, relief and humanitarian organizations where we're working with them to be able to provide a, a discount for their students or their, their staff who become our students and to be able to help uh, prepare them for the work that they're engaged in presently. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm a church. Uh, let's assume I'm located, say, on the Gulf Coast or something like that where um, the odds are good that at one point or another um, a visitation will happen. Uh, and uh, um, and there will be a uh, hurricane event or something like that, or maybe even uh, in certain parts of the Midwest we could have devastating tornadoes that, that have the same kind of impact on particular communities. How does it, what, do you, what advice do you give to a church to be prepared for that ahead of time? You know, 
getting ready for a disaster is a really is a major challenge for many congregations. And, you know, I think a lot of that starts with a, a couple of reasons. One is that just by human nature, we don't like to think that bad things are going to happen to us. And then on top of that, we tend to be really, really bad at actually predicting what we're most at risk for. You know, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, it was uh, probably about three years or so after Katrina, and I'd been asked to come up to the Mississippi Delta and work with a group of pastors and churches up there to help them to get ready for disasters. And so I show up to this large uh, pastors conference, and I, I get the introduction, and the very first thing somebody, you know, sitting out there um, asked me is, why are you even here? There's never been a hurricane that's made it all the way up to the Delta. And so in the back of my head, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a really fun morning together. <laughs> you know, this is, this is going to be great. So, yeah. Um, Show and, me why I need you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. pretty much telling me you're wasting our time. Yeah, 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 right. That was the Southern between the lines there. Uh -huh. You know, bless his heart that he came up here. And uh, so I was kind of getting my thoughts together, thinking about how do I even respond to this? And about that time, a, a train goes by, and it's so loud behind the church, I actually have to stop and just wait for it to pass, you know, before I could even be heard. And so as soon as it goes by, I pause for a moment, and I ask that pastor and the others sitting in the room about where's that train going to and from? And somebody pipes up of, oh, it's, it's going from uh, along the coast with the oil fields and the chemical plant, you know, on up further north to the refinery and to such and such chemical plant up that direction. And then there's this kind of pause, and then it hit them all that right there, right behind them, went some very deadly, you know, fuel and chemicals that if there was a derailment, could put their entire community at harm. You know, so we're not, again, just talking about these big disasters or terrorism. It really could be even these crises like this. And so one of the things that I would encourage churches to do is to try to better understand what are the actual risks in their community. But even maybe more important than that is to ask themselves, what has God called that church to do? And what has God equipped the church to do? You know, so if you have a, for example, a very strong children's ministry, then start there. If you already have an active ministry caring for the homeless, start there as a means to preparing. Hmm. And, uh, and, and you're right. I mean, the the way in which um, disasters can happen is surprising. We've had uh, uh, we've certainly heard how Amtrak has been unable to stay on the tracks here lately in a variety of ways uh, with uh, with a variety of disasters, and that puts pressure, uh, on, intense pressure on on the communities that are closest to those kinds of events, uh, uh, and and so I take it that. Um, some level of there's some level of preparation, and there's got to be some nimbleness in terms of uh, of what you might be prepared to do. That, that's spot on. That one of the most important things to do when preparing for a disaster isn't just the plan, but it's also having the right people around the plan that really counts. That in the event of the disaster happening, you, you just can't predict how things are going to fully play out. You know, there are steps you can take and that you can plan for and then you can help mitigate. But at the end of the day, you've got to have the right people within that congregation carrying out the plan who are going to be able to be flexible and roll with the changes that are going to inevitably happen. Yeah, because you don't know what, what you're actually going to have available to you as you step into the space that needs help. Uh, your example with the food and the refrigerators is a good classic example, it seems to me, of something that in your planning you might go, well, we can expect to be able to do this, and lo and behold, when you get there, you find out, nope, that's not available to us. We're going to have to think of plan B. And on top of that, you want to make sure that it, the plan isn't being held just by one person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was interesting a couple years ago. I was having lunch with a friend, and in walks in another uh, friend of mine who happens to be a pastor at a local church here in the Wheaton area, and he's with uh, another one of his staff there from the church, and we start talking, and you know, he asks, like, what is it you do? And I start talking about disasters, and the staff member uh, shares, oh, you know what, we really should have a disaster plan. And my friend pipes up, we, we have one. You know, so so here's somebody who's been a part of this church as a staff member for several years and doesn't realize that the church even has a plan. You know, so too often we make a plan and we think our work's done and it goes on a shelf and it gets dusty. If that's the case, you might as well not even have one. Hmm. 
Yeah, and and again, I suspect too that the part of the having the right people in place is, if I can say this, having the right kind of people in place who are who are uh, emotionally um, capable of dealing with this nimbleness that that inevitably is a part of a disaster or what a disaster requires in order to be dealt with. You know, sometimes churches may have a large enough staff that they may even have uh, maybe somebody on like the executive team that's or like facilities that might be over like risk management. But more often than not, most congregations don't have that sort of luxury. And the problem is sometimes it will fall only on the shoulders of the primary pastor, but they're going to be overwhelmed with all, all these other duties in the event of a disaster. So ideally, you'll either have a volunteer or maybe even an extended staff person that can take the lead and then form a really strong volunteer group around that person. That You really have to have a champion to carry this out. Hmm. Um, well, that's that's one element of it. Uh, how so? You said there's a one year program, and then there's a, 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 a the how long? How does the second program work? That's not so residential, I guess. Yeah, that that one we're really trying to make the hybrid program for people that are already working um, full time, and maybe it's um, you know they're in a stage of life where it makes it difficult to relocate, or you know they're in the job that they just want to advance and don't want to leave. So with that program, the way that we have it set up is people will come this coming August for two weeks on campus for face-to-face training. And then the um, they'll come back to campus two other times over two years. So just a total of four weeks um, on campus. And then the rest of it is all online. Hmm. Um, that's part of the flexibility that's being introduced in some of the programs in the graduate school, uh, and uh, where uh, where the model is a little bit different than the normal class. Because it's, it's I mean it's hard to it's hard to do disaster in a classroom. Right. 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 <laughs> well, and, and the other thing, too, is that, um, you know, I, when we were forming the program, I was reaching out to some of our alum from the college that have gone out to work in the relief world. And they were saying, you know, Jamie, if this program was around in, uh, when the Haiti earthquake hit and if there hadn't been an option for, say, some sort of online you would have lost probably most of your students because all of your students would have been called up by their organizations to spend that whole year in Haiti. You know, so they were saying you, you want to have both of those so that you can really um, you know meet people where they're at with the unique uh, context in which we work. That's fascinating. Um, let, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the refugee situation because that's a distinct kind of problem. Uh, and... Uh, um, we've we've done podcasts uh, with people who had relief organizations. We've had them tell the story of. I said, let let let's tell the story of what it's what it can be like for someone who is forced out of say the Middle East or forced out of certain Asian countries, and they're looking to relocate. What's their experience like? And it's it, it was it's pretty challenging in many ways. Most of them don't end up in refugee places. They have to go from place to place, fending on their own. So when you're training people to deal with refugees, what is it that you're focused on as you as you go about that kind of training? When, when we're helping others to get prepared to work with refugees, we're really trying to help them better understand the larger context that, you know, as we talk about the current refugee crisis, th- this isn't something that's only been happening since the last elections that seems to be when most people became aware of it. That This has been going on for a really, really long time and trying to help them understand what are these factors that have led to this crisis and and how does that all interplay and then also helping them to understand the refugee experience that uh, you know the average refugee tends to be on the wait list to get resettled for somewhere around 17 years before that actually ever happening for them at least into the United States and then on top of that understanding the challenges of those individuals when they do relocate you know so for example we did a study and got to walk alongside some women from um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and found that these Congolese women, almost all of them had been um, survivors of gender-based violence uh, while they were in the Congo at the time. And then they come to the United States and find that now they're alone, they don't understand the culture, that they feel even more isolated, that in many ways they experienced a whole second wave of trauma from just the cultural experience. So, I mean, just, I'm just I just processing. Imagine, in effect, your life being in limbo for 17 years. Um, most people, that would be 
extremely psychologically challenging. Most definitely. And in fact, you know, just this morning, I, I have three daughters and I was taking them to school. And because we're in Chicago right now, there's a fair amount of snow. Yeah. And sticking out of the snow, one of my daughters reads a sign that says, we are not afraid. And she asked me, Dad, what is that sign about? Well, and then I went on to explain to her that she was only seeing the very top part of the sign that right below it, it says, we welcome refugees. Hmm. And so I, I was telling her what the rest of the sign was. And she's like, why would people be afraid of refugees? So I was experience, you know, explaining this uh, to her, why some people are afraid. And then I said, but girls, I was like, I want you to understand, could you imagine what if a war happened here in Wheaton? You know, I wouldn't want us to stay here. You know, I would want what was best for you girls, and I would do what I could to protect you. And that might mean that we as a family would have to flee. And I was like, could you imagine what that would be like? I was like, refugees aren't someone to be afraid of. You know, they're people like us. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the and the human uh, the human challenge of of caring for someone who's been displaced for that kind of period of time, not knowing what their future holds, uh, where they're eventually going to live. The the idea if, for many refugees, they I mean they not only ha- are displaced, but they end up landing in a culture where they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they don't know the people, they don't have any contacts, etc. Uh, a, a terrifically challenging human experience in many ways. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think as Christians, we need to be active not only in providing direct care and working through our local churches, but also becoming advocates that we are, you know, speaking out on behalf of refugees within our communities, but then that we're also doing what we can in terms of policy, you know, supporting organizations like World Relief that have been doing this work for a long time, that um, and they're facing their own challenges. So there's also opportunities for the church to come a- alongside other Christian parachurch organizations like World Relief or World Vision, and um, IAFR is another one that comes to mind for me. That is another way that we can help. You know, sometimes people will detach this kind of work from the idea of Christian mission, and yet, in many ways, it is the it is the testimony that gives credibility to us as we think about um, what it is that we're doing and why it is why it is that we're doing it. Yeah, I think in times of disasters, um, we we had uh, uh, Philip Yancey, the best selling author. Uh, come speak at our annual disaster ministry conference a few years ago, which, by the way, will happen again this June for those that might be interested. And when um, Yancey was speaking, he talked about that doing disaster work is really hands-to-heart evangelism, Mm -hmm. that we're really putting our faith into practice and we're meeting people's needs in practical ways. And in doing so, we're really giving the gospel, um, really embodying it, as we're caring for others. Yeah, I see it as a building of credibility so that when you, you know, when you share with a person that God cares for you, God loves for you, whatever, and they've seen Christians demonstrate that care, there's a, there's a credibility that comes. You know, sometimes someone asks the question, why are you taking your time and your energy to help me? You don't know me from anybody, you know? And, and people perceive that, even if they may not have the language to express it. Um, and that opens the door for all kinds of possibilities. And, you know, I often think about the, the examples of, of Christ sharing to those who were hurting, that he didn't just share the good news and then be like, oh, good luck with that blindness thing. Yeah. Hope that uh, works out for you and, yeah. and leave. That, you know, he also took care of what the real need was in addition to the spiritual need. Yeah, and I like to reverse that picture. In other words, to say, I may not be able to help someone with blindness, but I can care for them as a person. You know, and so uh, and and so, it's very very important that that be communicated, et cetera. Now, uh, I take it that some of your program walks into these areas as well and discusses the circumstances and situations of refugees and that kind of thing. Yeah. So for us, disasters aren't just a single event, and that oftentimes that uh, unnatural disasters make it worse. You know, so for example, if you think about comparing the Haiti earthquake to the China earthquake or the Italy earthquake, that all of those were actually very similar in terms of the population size and densities where they struck. They were very similar in terms of the overall size of the actual um, earthquakes. Yet we saw Haiti and um, China suffer a lot more losses. 
uh, in terms of life and resources. And one of the reasons for that is poverty that's there, you know, government corruption that was happening. So we tackle issues of uh, poverty and development in our program. And then we also help our students to understand that these disasters are connected to things like the refugee crisis or to climate change. Uh, human trafficking would be another uh, key example. Now, you mentioned that you deal with that as well, uh, which which is fascinates me uh, in in the sense of it, it shows how big a category disaster is, and how we how we mistreat one another is certainly a disastrous situation. Um, so. Um, talk a little bit about that. Uh, is, and, and it's the issue in relationship to human trafficking, kind of, for lack of a better description, and I'm, I may misspeak here, uh, the process of rescuing someone out of it, which means that they're going to be relocated and, and go through, well, obviously there's the psychological trauma of what they've been in, but also, the, you know, um, the establishing the ability to have a new life. Yeah, you know, it, when a disaster strikes, it makes the most vulnerable even more vulnerable and makes them vulnerable in particular to being exploited. So, for example, you mentioned about being from Houston. R- you know, right there in, in the Houston area, shortly after the disaster, there were online ads all over the place talking about, you know, if you're a woman of a certain age, you know, send a picture. Um, I can help you if you've lost everything. So now that that doesn't necessarily mean that that person was a trafficker on the other side of that ad, but it's an example of how there are people for sure out there ready to take um, advantage of individuals who've lost everything. Mm. We also see, you know, so that's an example from Houston. Uh, Another one would be what I saw in Haiti after the earthquake, where there were a lot of children that were orphaned and or maybe lost one parent. And then traffickers would come in and say, oh, we promise to give your child a better life. Give them to us and we'll help them find a loving family in the city only to take that child and put them into a slavery situation um, after the earthquake. Or another example would be after Katrina, that it would be even um, labor trafficking, which people, I think, sometimes forget that there was a a major case there where about four or 500 individuals from India had been promised to come over to the U.S. uh, by um, a job-searching organization and said, if you come here, you'll have a great job, we'll help you get a visa and all of this, only to really take them hostage and actually keep them guarded at night with armed guards and force them to stay and then even pay for being here and took advantage of of those men that were were trafficked in that way. Hmm. Uh, And so your your trafficking, the trafficking part of your program looks at those realities and deals with um, care, rescue. What how does how does that part of it work? You know, one of the ways that our our program is structured is that we have classes that that delve into these challenging topics. But at the same time, um, our courses are also designed to prepare our students with a set of competencies that will give them the skills that they need, whether they're going to be um, on the ground, you know, kind of boots on the ground, or even if they're going to work as maybe in a leadership role um, within – you know, the headquarters, for example, or fundraising even, that they have this wide realm of skills that then they can apply to help address these different challenges. So you're developing the nimbleness uh, in in the person to be able to deal with whatever may come across their desk, because in one sense, what I'm hearing through everything that's being said is there, you can... You can plan for a disaster, but there's no way to plan for a disaster. You have to respond to what's on the ground. That is part of the plan. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah so, and that's that's part of it, that you, you need to be aware that you know there are things that you can do, and there are things you can control, but then what do you do for the unexpected? And so you're kind of drilling that into people so that they have that flexibility, so that they can adapt quickly. Because when a disaster strikes, like for instance, um, we often will take teams of students with us, either maybe it's to uh, the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, or maybe it's to different disaster zones like uh, Harvey, for example. And when we go, one of the things that the students realize is that the plan we have in place to help in response by 8 a.m. is going to be different, typically by about 10 a.m. That And everybody ends up pitching in and helping with all the different roles just because the need is too great for one person to be able to handle. And, and, and you discover things that you didn't realize walking in that are, in fact, the reality that you have to cope with. Yeah, because every disaster is different. You know, one of the things that uh, made an impression on me after the Louisiana um, – flood that happened in 2016 was when we went down there, just all of a sudden we started hearing people talking about having uh, dry guilt, 
Um, and, and what they were talking about was survivor's guilt, hmm. but they were saying that they were having that because maybe my house stayed dry and my neighbor lost everything. Or, you know, I had one, a few people that even talked about having minnow guilt, like, like the tiny fish mm-hmm. that, well, yes, I had flooding, but I only had two feet and my neighbor had six feet, hmm. you know, so there's that sense of guilt. So e- every disaster will sometimes takes on its own phenomenon or, you know, unique challenge that is happening just to that particular group. So if someone were interested in this kind of training, uh, how would they how would they find out about it? Is there a w- website to go to, that kind yeah, of thing? I, I would encourage them to go to uh, Wheaton backslash HDI and uh, when, excuse me, Wheaton.edu backslash HDI and you can find out more about the program there. So HDI is the abbreviation for Human Disaster Institute, or Humanitarian Disaster Institute. Um, and uh, and how long does that process take? It's just like a normal application process in getting into a school? Yes, it's a normal application. Um, now, just to let folks know who are listening that our deadline is coming up on March 1st, but we also realize you may just be hearing about this for the first time. Don't let that you know, veer you from applying, just reach out to us by email and we would be glad to work with you. Is that March 1st in every year or is it, uh, does that date change and it's just early in, sometime in early in March every year? Uh, it's, it's typically March 1st for us yearly, mm-hmm. uh, but at the same time, we also realize that um, there may be some flexibility depending on, you know, for instance, if we still happen to have a slot available, you know, we might be able to still admit somebody beyond that. Okay. Well, Jamie, I really thank you for coming on and, and walking us through your program and, and telling us a little bit about the Institute, what's motivated you, uh, giving some discussion of the Christian values that form around it. It's been a very, very informative uh, exercise. I know I've learned a lot in listening to this and really do appreciate the uh, the effort and the reflection that goes into designing a program like this and, and of course, then executing it. So we really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. And we thank you for being a part of the table, and we hope you'll come back again soon. And we hope that the, uh, what you've heard today inspires and encourages you to think about the way you care for those around you and, and the issues that sometimes that reflects. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.